Hi everyone, you're all very welcome to the online launch of Channel Issue 10. It's always a pleasure for us on the channel team to put these online launches together as a way of showcasing our contributions, local and international, to a global audience, and especially as a way of celebrating the diversity of places and parts of our shared living worlds that inspire their work. Issue 10 really speaks across distances. It's full of fantasies of elsewhere, dreams of Hollywood, or of a last past, or a last homeland, but also of close attention to ground on defeat, wherever that may be for each speaker. And we hope you're touched by it, wherever it finds you. A few thank yous before we get started. First of all, to the contributors themselves, all of those whose work is featured in this issue, and especially those who who've sent in reasons or photos for tonight's launch, as well as to Cecilia Bulo, whose beautiful artwork is featured on this issue's cover. A big thanks as well to the Arts Council and all our patrons and subscribers for financially supporting our work. We wouldn't be able to offer a platform for these talented writers and artists without you. So without any further ado, I'll hand you over now to the newest member of our team, our wonderful 2024 publishing intern, Emily Assault Sutton, who will tell you more about what to expect from us. Hi everyone, thanks a million for watching our online launch of Channel Issue 10. I'm Emily Assault Duggan and I'm the publishing intern for 2024 here at Channel. It's been an absolute pleasure to work on Issue 10 and I'm very excited for everyone to read it. We had a wonderful in-person launch in Dublin last week and it's brilliant to be able to celebrate with everyone further afield with this online video launch. We have an amazing lineup of pre-recorded readings from Issue 10 contributors, as well as some photo and video content showcasing some of the places they're living in and writing from. The lineup is available in the description box below with timestamps to let you know which reader will be up when. There are also closed captions available for this video if you need them. First up, our cover artist, Cecilia Bulo, is going to introduce us to her work. Um, hello, uh, my name is Cecilia Bulo. Uh, I wanted to say a big thank you to everybody at Channel Magazine for inviting me to be uh, the cover artist for Isha Tan. Um, I mainly make sculptures and installations um, but I've decided to share with you a um, small video um, that I made in relation to the work that it's on the cover. And uh, it's uh, I kind of wanted to share more about my thought process and the relationship that sometimes, you know, occurs between the materials and the research practice that is, uh, you know, goes hand in hand in, in my work. And um, so... Thank you again. Uh, uh, grazie. Nauseous chaos, diaphanous entrails, spilling inside, the outer skin bursting, sublime the timeless voices. Poison tubes and chants of plague chase a displaced Artemis in search of lambs to slaughter. My name is Casey Jarin, and I'm delighted to be included in Channel Issue 10. Thanks especially to the editors for the incredible care you've taken in bringing together such beautiful community around the in-person launch in Dublin last week and here in the online launch. Um, my poem emerges from a long-standing personal obsession uh, with deep sea creatures, um, their bodies, their anatomies, their behaviors, their secret lives. Um, Thinking about the connection between the animal and the human, uh, but also pushing back against this idea that uh, we're defined by our anatomy uh, and uh, trying to get inside what the experience of living inside a body means. Um, 
and uh, complicating this idea that the body is a problem or a site of trauma or exclusively a site of trauma. Uh, and, you know, looking at you know, what, what, would it, what would it mean to think about the body, the human body, the animal body as a site of exuberant possibility. Um, the one last thing I'll say is that it's a shape poem that is sort of playing with a lot of, of things that are on my mind uh, in terms of like how might we think of poems as musical notation or as theater performance or stage directions. Um, and in this case also, you know, how might the the movement and the uh, the kind of uh, persona of, of the character at the center of this poem uh, kind of come to life on the page. Hectocotylus. Don't be fooled. The paper nautilus is not a nautilus. Not at all. Not us, but her. An octopus in nautilus drag. Paper thin costume tailored to her exact dimensions. An argonaut in a hat designed to protect her delicate eggs. Not a bone to be found. The paparazzi can't get enough. They'll stop at nothing to catch her as she curls arms around her head, sidesteps, then soldiers on, one tentacle at a time. Their cameras, deep sea predators, Shutters waiting to snap. If you listened, she'd say, I'm moving west, putting final touches on a novel, a screenplay, an autobiography, really, an unrhymed verse. I'm a polyglot, a multitude, not swayed by reviews. I don't need an audience to know I exist. Thanks. Hi, my name is Kevin Cahill. Um, I'd like to thank the editors of Channel Magazine, Ashley, Cassia and Emily for including me in the latest issue and for inviting me to do this reading. I'd like to read two poems. Um, the first one is called Starwort. Starwort. You can think of her as an injured infant, tobacco brown as the street lit stars above. When you're with her alone, you are inclined to put a comfortable catkin under her head, to rest her head back as though she were part of a post-Christian pieta, bleeding from her molestations. It is in your tears you learn to conjure her back, accept yourself as her parent, coaxing her like a new potato to feed at the lip of the compost. She is your daughter, as graspable as a baby handed to you in the maternity ward, innocent, membranous, bawling the rude bar of her existence, God's sun-kissed sister in a blanket of straw and Turkish cotton. Having dropped her once, you are now extra careful when holding her, seizing her fragrance to your breast. This child is moss-backed, her eyes are moon-filled baskets under the cattle's feet, bracts brown with seed. And now she is head down at the nipple, your daughter, a little bud in the shawl. The second poem I would like to read is called Finding Love Online. Finding Love Online, a contradiction. Yet the dumb flowers of the fingers blossom over the keypad and blacken with honeybees. Heart emojis, rose emojis, stars and wine glasses. They dribble in a sort of digital fever from our messages. 
and then a real uncamouflaged emotion is relayed from a pixel. When my face became blood and I closed the lid, I saw you still. I tasted your words at the dinner table. Your phrases smothered the faces of my friends. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Cassia and Emily and Nick and Ashlyn and indeed Elizabeth uh, who supported me in the past with channel. Um, superb to be able to get the work out there and along with all these other writers. I'll get on with it. It was found in a ditch by the side of the road, rolled in old towels and curtains, red and gold. It was headless and had been shot. It was seen first in that slightly out of focus social media saturated smudge where the eye knows what it is seeing, but no matter how the mind tries, it can't focus any closer. She had been shot. It was plain who she was, but not who she was. Identity could only come so close before it too was beheaded. She wasn't hidden. She hadn't been buried. She was wrapped and she, most of her, was there at the side of the road. Who would shoot a deer and behead it and leave it there? Not a big deer, a small one, like some shark on social media, sinking with its fin cut off and all the rest of that great mass of it discarded. Where was her great mass and how long had she been sinking and was it worse that she'd been wrapped in old cloth, cloth kept beyond its initial life, waiting to be useful again and this was its end also, swelling a corpse? Other than that, it was a golden autumnal day, with the light on the birches allowing the colder blue of the sea to be bluer than ever. Alone at the side of the road, she knows that somehow this body will be with her forever. At this time in this life, she can feel the image of it sinking into her to places she had never been, depths where those parts of her that could swim in the dark were happy to continue and continue. The blackbird sings of hidden orchards, he wrote, but it's not the meal high on the branch, melodious and definitively drawn all to the density of its form, its golden hallowed eye. No, it is the haunted, retreating call of the female which draws the eye to hidden places, hiding places, a call which defines the edges of what we cannot see, a call as of a ghost speaking of another world that we, that we, will always be foreign to. In the brightness of day, in the midst of the crowd, at the heart of things, and yet. Jenny Wren in the hedge, shrew in the walnut tree. These little creatures seem to scare us in some way. Our primal prejudices, our superstitions visit upon them such violent ends. Wonder at her walking abroad in the light, aware. The geese passed last night, late, heading south, not so high, seemingly just beyond the slates, maybe out from us a bit along the law. The calling, the calling, the calling. Winter is coming. I'll wait for them to return and drag the sun and the soft air back to us in the longer evenings, but for now, but for now, but for now. She carries with her a warning. Not something she does intentionally, not a message she wants to deliver, just something carried inherently within. Hello, my name is Tomas. I want to first of all express my heartfelt gratitude to Cassia, Ashlyn, Emily and all the team at the Channel Magazine for this wonderful opportunity to be part of this really vibrant community of poetry and poets and to say thank you and well done to all my fellow poets who also feature in this magazine. My poem is called Germination. There is an orange tulip on the ceiling sprayed by curtain cast sunlight with white stalks beside and bright soil beneath. It reaches for the lampshade in the middle Meanwhile, a displaced voice in this place speaks in my ear of the whole universe being one bright pearl. 
The tulip leans ever more towards me as the sun moves outside. I don't know how this happens, do you? All this colour slipping through dips in the curtain to splay a picture just for me, hunched on blue. You would too, hunch on blue I mean, if you were in a scene like this. But when would you move? Would you dare to leave the flower alone? I did once. My granda died in the middle of a night on his own. He pursed his lips when offered a swab of water. His small black eyes looked and looked as I spoke. As I left his side, the nurses moved his body to move him on. His mouth open, his head slanted toward me, pleading while the blue and white swaddled him away. And this poem is called Kylie and the Elephant Man. She brushes my hand back as I interrupt her viewing of the video trailer about the Elephant Man, who flees as doctors chase him, his sackcloth hood fallen away. Again, for the screen, my right hand reaches, then both hands. My daughter firmly grips between her thumb, forefinger and palm, laughing as she continues to stare. In the background, Kylie is singing of holding on to now, her voice dancing on the notes and beats as we hear the flute song following, rising and dipping like the fall of water down the gouged face of a mountain. My Ignorant History of Maps My ignorant history of maps began on my father's survey crew in Alaska. Transit and chain, vellum and scale, what the fixed lines separated was forfeit, faulty as a jeweler's eye. How many facets to a divided land, how many pickaxed along the ruddy vein. Surveying was the journey but a part of me wanted to settle. A part of me wanted to leave the forest alone. We hammered pipes into stolen soils, devil's club thrashing at the machete, presenting many thorns for its beheading. Welcome to the village I live in, Belsela in Belgium. Siblings, would we have drawn spades and clubs if the river had not cut the land in two? If we had heard its constant murmur towards the same sea? If we had followed those prayers from our parents' folded hands, that, soft and flawless and intertwined and once upon a time, had eloped to the mountains. Here's the gold on either side of the bed where the river sprang, buried with our mother. Hi, my name is Kira Nicomine Lucklin, and I am a writer from County Wexford, Ireland. A big thank you to the channel team for selecting this piece for this issue. This is my piece, Waning Waxing. She sags against the smooth of a standing stone, eyes rolled back and sighing out gales of wind. I wait for her to speak first. Her eyelids begin to relax, and I decide to begin the conversation. 
I ask her how she is feeling. Today, my name is Ku. The morning sun pours through summer leaves and into the spiral carvings of the rock. Our next appointment is in the gut of a headland in Inishone. Above ground, the rain is as fierce as hail. The wind is sharp, cutting through loose fences and weak branches. Today, her name is Thown. She draws her knees to her chest, leaving red crescent moons in the sides of her knees. I tell her to remember her belly breathing techniques. This makes her cry up to the roof of the cavern. I ask her if she feels the need to have control over external issues in order to feel comfortable and regulated. She tells me that I haven't been listening. I tell her that I'm trying my best to guide her through her issues and to understand. Maybe we should talk about how we can work together more in our next session. Earth asks if we can meet next between Beltane and Lunasa in a field of blooming rapeseed. She has dyed her hair to match the blue and purple hues of burn rock at dusk in November. Could be a possible indication of BPD, borderline personality disorder. Somewhere has been flooding all winter in the Southern Hemisphere. Her banks broke and bled out. Her body language is tense and anxious. She's saying she's dried out up north though. She feels unstable, unbalanced, and she says everything she does fucks everything up somehow. Another example of catastrophizing. I decide to rein the conversation in and ask her about her daily routine. What would be the best way to start your day mindfully? She likes masturbating in the mornings, but she hasn't been doing this. Why? She thinks her sex drive has lowered, most likely due to high levels of stress, anxiety and exhaustion after short manic episodes. I'm too scared to wank. Scared? Are you afraid that you won't be able to climax? When she starts, her hands turn brittle. I ask her, does she feel connected to her body when she tries? No, I already told you it's too dry up north and I've been drowning the south, but I don't know how to make it stop. Fibonacci Spiral you are held by your mother, who pats your back like a divine instrument. You stare down at me as if I am a grotesque underground creature, and I look at you as if I know you. Then she turns you around and shows me who you are, your dome with coiled grass, sunflower seeds cuddling one another, a tornado stirring up sand, the deep secret of pine cones, a thousand generations of bees. You remind me of who I am. I want to punch crack the ground over my head. Surface I believed you were too sensitive for the world, let alone to be a mother but your thin arms held her like oak trees, or you must have drawn strength from another source. Too often I give in to the convenience of words. The photo slices through your skin to show your rings, a layered maze. I look away. I see too much of me, whom I had concluded too weak to be. A mother. I'm Angeline Schellenberg from Winnipeg, Canada, and here are my two poems from the 10th issue of Channel. This is a found poem of responses to a question on Quora about losing faith. An opaque shell. I wasn't born believing in sky. Life being long, my answers have their questions. Beyond this one small blue dot, inside the whale, faith is a good way to be wrong. Most of us reach the destination, life being short. Because nothing is working out for me as planned. I went out in the snowy night. The title of this next piece, Sleepy Transformation, Ends of the Earth, 
is an online mistranslation of the scientific names of the northern and southern monarch butterflies, Danis plexibus and Danis erpus. Sleepy transformation, ends of the earth. A nectar-sated monarch on each shoulder. I deserve to be pawed for my love by a dozy retriever. Chickadees pressing pins and needles into my palm. To let go of speech and socks, even spoons. To stumble into spring like an astronaut returning, awestruck by gravity and oak moss breezes, relearning how to walk. I deserve far more than what the hollow eel in my head wants for me. Eat shit, she says. Swerve left, she says, on this two-lane road. To snort like a mutt in a sunbeam, tongue lolling, my nose absorbing, absorbing this one loamy earth. To be brushed by an infant's pine bough tongue, delicious as the first breath of sleep. I'll end with one poem about the color ivory from my third book, Mondegreen Riffs, coming in September, 2024. Ivory, the elephant in the room, dreams of hand-me-down crochet that tower, roll the dice, Citrus-scented nosegay, pearls tumble. There is a beach found only in my dream, exposed as my dog's belly. Cold cream melts down my father's wrist as I say, I'm pregnant. Waves of surrender. He loves me, he loves me not. Hi, my name is Laura Adrian Brady. Thank you so much for including me in this beautiful issue. Um, this is my poem, My Friend Reminds Me We Are Wild Mustangs. I have just told her about my first date with a man who keeps reaching for my hand even as I inch back into prickly bushes, arms crossed and stuck to my body like baked bread. Even after I have told him I want friendship before romance, he remains a puppy dog who throws himself again and again at my knees. His eyes are liquid and kind as he ignores each message I send from mouth and posture. I am not one to find such creatures a threat to life or limb, innocent cuddlers as they may be. But then I remember a crew of great Pyrenees dogs at a ranch in Tucson, how they lay across the lawn like beached whales, bellies melting at my touch, and gazed up at me with the look of milk, heavy babies. And how later, at the distant cry of a coyote, they rose as one, bellowing a deep war call that pierced my stomach and bolted like the thrust of a knife into the mesquite, a mob out for blood. How they returned, with their tails lowered, white coats streaked with filth, and relaxed back into domestic teddy bears as easily as wine into desert sand. My friend reminds me that many men only want a wild horse in theory. Few will wait for her to hang her head before stretching to pet her coat. They have not yet learned, as my father says, how to love with an open hand. A horse gentler once explained to me how he befriends a wild mustang. Slow and steady, at sunrise he enters her pen with a chair and a bucket of apples. He sits for hours, still, but for his weathered hand that turns a book's pages like water washing stone. The mustang flicks her mane in challenge until he departs, leaving the apples. For six months or more, he repeats the ritual until one day the horse cocks an ear in his direction, a flag of truce, and the next day she stomps until he raises his gaze, and then one rainy morning, because she feels playful when he is there, she comes all the way up to him, extends her head, and swipes the apple from his upturned fingers. Thank you so much.
Hello, I'm Claire Booker and I'm really thrilled to be in this issue of Channel Magazine, to be in the magazine again. It's a great place to be, so thank you for taking my work. And I'm going to read you two of the poems, uh, well, the, the two poems in, in this issue. Um, the first one is uh, about the River Thames. I lived in London for many years, a very busy river, a very busy lot of people. Tidal River. A gull lifts over St. Paul's with an eel in its beak, writhing to the drumbeat of pile drivers. No one escapes these deep blows into quince green mud. People fossick around bins, prams, benches, the backwash of Sunday, babel tongued beside the prowling river's cache of sweat dark spoil. Planks, crates, plastic cups, a cool box, tipsy crazy pink, something that was a tree is clawing through pier struts. A bottle bobs backwards towards whopping, sways like a drunk along buttresses that lace the river in. Mudlarks plunder the sea-fattened foreshore, find coins, pots, swords. At low tide, a sculptor turns sand into money. And my second poem uh, I wrote since moving to this lovely part of the south of England, the south coast near Brighton, among the downs. We have lots of farms and crops and sheep. And this poem is about one of those lovely moments when you're surprised by something. The flax crop. Tiny globe heads make contours of merging tones. Burnt purples, tans, tarnished golds sweep this vast arable stretch. Colours patched by differences in tillage and scarf. There must be millions shivering in company, caught by the root, hemmed in by landscape. I'm edging my way down the chalky trod when the crop shakes out a family of quails. They too have been sown by human will. Now free, they lift their feet whistling up the path's slim arrow. So thank you very much. Really looking forward to reading all the wonderful work that's I know always in Channel Magazine and have a lovely rest of the evening. Bye. My poem, My Georgic, has this epigraph from Avon Bolan. If there is an epic, to a Georgic, let be the down and earth, literal, sifting, critical, and absolute devotion to a way of life. Though my grandfather lost the farm during the Great Depression, had to leave with 13 kids, those years of driving machines and horses of pet ducks and pigs remain dad's favorite. Mom, the city girl, loved streetcars, then buses, walking, not driving. The Eastern Europeans crammed into the neighborhood their gardens of garlic, their garlicky dinners. When Dad returned from the war, he compromised on a plot they bought midst a lake and woods. Just one neighbor, half mile away at a city bus, ran Maslin to Canton. All too soon, it became suburbs. Dad always raised the garden, Mom ignored it. He loved his tomatoes, peppers, radishes, and cabbages, the green beans he shared with the rabbits. Now I own that yard. My husband and I are no good at husbandry. We mostly grow heirloom tomatoes. He runs long distance. I walk the dog. We disagree on how many dogs to own. Across the road lies the lake, some woods, and meadows. So any Georgic of mine will run much shorter than Virgil's, have a sense of bipolarity, and lack much instruction. 
go long on pasta sauce and gratitude. Hello, I am Jamie Sampson. Um, I want to thank Channel for including my story in issue 10. It's called There Are No Stairs in This House and I'll just read a short bit of it. Uh, I want to apologize in advance for the truly terrible American accent. I, I didn't write it expecting to be reading it in public. So bear with me. The ferry took the bones of an hour to reach Lambkin Island. Paul spent most of the crossing out on the viewing deck, smoking cigarettes. His elbows leaned on a large, heavy cardboard box that he had carried with him from the mainland. Paul was quite alone on the deck until a man with a fanny pack, an American, came out to join him. Not quite the weather for whale watching, the American declared. Oh, Paul said, are there whales? My book says there are. But there was no book. He didn't have a book. The book was implied. The American richly inhaled the wet, cold, blustery air and let out a satisfied gasp. These are what we call in Ohio the elements, and you're out here braving them. What gives? I don't do well on boats, Paul explained. Being out in the open helps. Lampkin Island slowly transpired in the grey light and sea vapours. Under such mists, the place looked even less habitable than normal. A great big stone fist rising out of the sea. Isn't that special, the American said. He took pictures. It is. You visiting for any particular reason or just tourism? I was born on the island, Paul said. Haven't been back in a few years. I'm going to see my mother. The American was stunned by this piece of information. You were born on that thing, he said. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Not, Not quite, quite the, the weather, weather for, for whale, whale watching. watching. Hi, this is Brittany Corrigan. I'm from Portland, Oregon in the United States, and I'm going to be reading you the two poems that appear in this issue of Channel. The first is Duplex with Eponymous Birds. There's a little epigraph at the beginning that reads, it's important that we don't just identify birds, but that we begin to identify with birds. And that's from J. Drew Lanham. Duplex with eponymous birds. I imagine birds shedding their names, the way they shuck seeds at the feeder. They shuck sunflower seeds to feed on, and the husks of white men fall to the ground. The husks of white men long underground are nothing like the names birds call each other. Notes for names, birds call to each other while they still can, in what lands are left. While we still can, in what lands are left, we observe and rename wing by wing. As we observe and rename wing by wing, hawks, jays, and sparrows unlatch from the past. Hawks, Jays and sparrows recast, fly past. Imagine each bird shedding its name. And the second poem is another duplex. It's called Duplex with Black-Tailed Deer. And this takes place in Mineral, Washington. When the town is less human than deer, each lawn becomes a meadow. Each yard becomes a meadow. Lawns give way to woods. The cemetery with its tilted graves becomes a cemetery of stilted ghosts. Deer graze in the winter mist among stones. Deer graze in winter mist as they roam between tavern and church down to the lake. Tavern to church to lake between dusk and dawn. Deer click in the streets, fade into trees. Deer click through the streets, made of tree light and silence. 
We want to place our hands on hides, silent. Want a place to hide uncloven hands. In this town, we're less human, more dear. Thanks so much for including me. Hello, channel. Uh, I'm very sorry not to have been able to be there for the, the in-person launch, but um, it's nice to be here. Um, so uh, the first poem is called Catfish. Um, and uh, there's a kind of a subtitle, which is the Narmer palette, because that's sort of what it describes. So you can Google that, uh, but yeah, uh, Catfish. Two men. On his knees, the first gapes back like an owl, eyes void. Here, in the last seconds of his life, he is already without a name. Above him, grasping his hair with one hand, wielding a stone mace with the other, Narmer. Conqueror and conquered both inscribed on this plane between symbols. A bird with one talon holding a sphinx. Two men below the ground tapping it like a roof. A pair of oxen in the sky with faces knowing and disturbed. Terror of the Nile. Catfish, Narmer, devours the weak consumes the small and is consumed. He is trapped in the moment before it starts, hands raised with the weapon about to fall with someone's life about to end. He will remain for as long as history survives with one arm aloft, waiting, about to begin, about to become king like a lobster frozen in warm water where the heat is rising. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one more. Uh, and uh, this second one is called A Place. In the sky above every city, there is a place forever changing color and always dark. Dark with mornings raw and light glister, Dark with heaviness, grayness, the plinth of night, dark and empty, except the moon, except the sun, with the looming splendor of melancholy and the drunk radiance of joy. There is a place beyond the tallest buildings in the air they reach for without touching, that they efface, hide, but do not destroy. There is a place where the line of thought quivers and the hue of feeling walks exposed like the crest of flame tiptoeing on a candle. There is a place of words like strings poised above the frets of things longed for, notes showering on the streets, windows like hail that makes us run off, take shelter, look back. There is a place where people cry out, starving, for what they do not want and are never full. But in their mouths drawn open, they can taste delicious rain, delicious ice, delicious fog, delicious dust. There is a place of fresh herbs and leaves sprouting, falling like fragrances where they vanish. There is a place I wish we knew. I wish we could go back and forth like birds there to spend our lives together without losing them. I wish that somehow, gently like a child sleeping on my shoulders, I could carry that place somewhere home to give to you, and it would be my heart, and it would be yours always. I wish this night was endless. I wish we did not pass through. I wish just once I could speak the right words to bottle time, I wish it would keep us young, safe, happy, and with our friends, this night frozen before dawn. Oh, my love, this night is ours and ending. Kiss me.
pull me close. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, channel, and uh, thank you all of you. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, everybody else's stuff uh, when I see it. Uh, thank you. Hi, Jen. That's it for tonight. So thank you all very much for tuning in. And I hope you've enjoyed our Contributors work. If you'd like to enjoy more of it, you can buy a copy of Issue 10 on our website or through any of our status. And we also have subscription and patronship options available for anyone who can afford to offer further financial support. I'm also delighted to let you know that submissions are now open for Issue 11 and they'll remain open until the 20th of June. So please do head over to our website if you'd like to learn more about how to submit some work to us. A final a huge thank you to all this issue's contributors and everyone involved in the creation of Issue 10 for making it such a beauty. Wishing you a safe and happy summer, and we'll see you again in October for our next issue.